Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. So hello everyone and uh, welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Simon Walsh from uh, Belfast, Ireland, uh, who is also a senior medal director at uh, Boston Scientific and one of the fathers of CTO PCI in Europe and around the world from the very early days of the procedure. So Simon, um, thanks again and welcome to Sensei Podcast. Uh, Manos, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. So Simon, you've done a, a unique uh, a course essentially. I mean, you've learned this very early and you've taught many people. How how did that come for you? Did you always want to become a complex city operator or this has just happened down the line? Uh, to be honest, it was <clears throat> it was an evolution of clinical need. Um, we in, in Northern Ireland, you know, it's like the west of Scotland, maybe sort of, uh, Northern Europe, Finland, we have a very high prevalence of coronary disease. And um, uh, for many years, we've had a, a high amount of surgery, so a lot of post-bypass patients. And um, in our healthcare system, uh, we had a, a sort of surgical service that just never really was properly funded or resourced and couldn't keep up with demand. So the patients who were on the, the sort of borderline of, of operable or not, uh, <clears throat> the surgeons didn't really fancy them taking up lots of ICU time in beds. Uh, so they were happy if we could offer an equivalent revascularization percutaneously that, that we could treat them uh, well and uh, it sort of evolved into a, a sort of situation of need for those post-bypass patients who were very limited and then for the ones who couldn't quite make it to surgery uh, that we were able to offer them a revascularization that would be as equivalent as we could make it. So that really drove us into the whole sort of CTO game as much as you know the calcium stuff and everything else. Um, it was to, to make sure that we offered a service to, to a significant proportion of patients who were just potentially being uh, left behind. Um, and that um, it wasn't what we wanted for, for patients, obviously. And then, but then how did you actually st- start doing this? Did you work with some people you know, by yourself? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, to be fair, Colm Hanratty and I sort of uh, bound, bound together uh, and we explored a lot of the, the early techniques and, and stuff ourselves. Um, and there was a lot of fumbling around in the dark, to be quite frank. And uh, we started out retrograde with all sorts of uh, you know antique style equipment back in the day, and um, uh, and then we we fell in with uh, James Spratt and and realised that we were sort of all trying to do the same thing, and kind of formed a little bit of a, a group, and we we hop across to each other's labs here and there and uh, and over time sort of evolved into meet more of the international community and 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 pick things up and move things forwards that way. So it was a bit of a a, a, um, a blindfolded beginning, uh, which eventually became enlightened. Um, but a lot of trial and error and a, a lot of uh, a lot of things, you know, discovering uh, what's good and what's bad and where the limits are of, of different techniques and technologies, which uh, I'm afraid had to be done the hard way back at that stage. And then, but but now, obviously, you've codified this, right? You put it down in a much better way. You teach many people with that, and you have some of the best illustrations in your books and Optima. So, how has that come full circle? I mean, if you someone had to start learning now, would you advise them to go through the trial and error, or should they just go through the uh, <laughs> basic steps? <laughs> no, I, I would definitely. I would much rather have had the option of being uh, well informed and having a good understanding of, of what I was trying to achieve, and even just an understanding of all the different tools and, and techniques. Um, I think people who are forearmed with that knowledge are definitely in a much better position than we were back in the day. So I very much would not encourage people to take the pathway that we did. Uh, thankfully, that's no longer necessary. Absolutely. And then, so how I, I still see my mind all the illustrations you've created with James and Colm, which are, you know, very, one well, of the best illustrations I've seen, very to the point and really make it very teaching. How did you get the idea for doing those and, and how do you actually do them? How has that come to your day to day practice translation into uh, teaching other people? 
Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, uh, James has really led that in partnership with um, a UK uh, group called Vascular Perspectives and um, Adrian Brown in particular, uh, who had an interest in, in educating and um, the, the sort of evolution of the um, distillation of a complex principle to something that was simple and understandable was sort of the tenet of what you were striving to achieve. Uh, it was to make things uh, as straightforward as possible for people to to grasp the concept of all right there may be a lot of subtlety and nuance around the actual delivery of that but <clears throat> i think if you can grasp the concept well that puts you in a good position to move forwards to learn the actual manual skills of it um, <clears throat> so that had always been the sort of the mantra really when we were producing educational material was to make sure it was as, as straightforward as could be mainly image based with not, not screens or slides with hundreds of words that you know people sort of look at them and immediately switch off or want to shoot themselves in the head you know so that that is as and then over time it's evolved into a, a much more refined and streamlined process so it, it might start with a doodle uh, and a, a concept and then a discussion and then there's now professional uh, graphical illustrators to, to really uh, put the gloss on it and, and make it very understandable and, and those guys are fantastic at their job. And then as far as, as yourself goes I mean, you've done so many and you're very comfortable, obviously, with all the complex techniques. Do you feel that you've matured enough that you've learned pretty much all? Are there still things you're learning? How, how do things work for you? Oh, no, every, every day is a school day. Uh, and I, <laughs> I think um, it's always important that, you know, even though we've done lots and lots of stuff that we do keep an open mind and we continually evolve and learn. And, you know, it's, it is a fast-moving uh, technological space. There's new things coming along all the time. And I think, it, you know, sometimes we get a bit set in our ways or there's always a, a risk that we can um, um, dismiss something as an option uh, out of hand just because we, we, we don't conceptually like the idea. But when you, you go about the, the trying of it and understanding of it, then uh, you can rapidly sort of change and evolve your practice to a better place. Uh, so I think having an open mind is important and it is important to keep sort of trying the new tools you know, adopting things that make sense uh, and not adopting things that don't make sense, but but always to be willing to uh, to do new things. And what do you find the hardest thing to teach? You know, the many people that you see and you talk to, what is the hardest thing you're finding to teach someone? Um, I think the practical skills are, are what they are. You know, moving wires, doing this, crosses out. Those things are fine, and, and some people will grasp it more quickly. And people have different learning curves. And I think was it Obama that talked about the the arcs of history and times and things. And that that's just the nature of how people learn. I think for me, the biggest subtlety in, in um, how we deal with patients is actually around who maybe should we have the maturity to say that we shouldn't treat, and also to teach people that sort of the 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 line upon where you know, you're crossing over into a potential harmful or highly risky situation and to try and stay on the other side of it and always err with your practice not to sort of be in, in the, the um, area where you, you're in a high risk zone because ultimately if you're, if you're there a lot of the time, many times you will get away with it but often as not, unfortunately, complications or, or bad things will happen. So it's learning that judgment of, of where the limits of techniques and technologies are and that just takes uh, an experiential sort of um, time. And there's no way around that except for, for doing a bunch of cases and understanding, you know, oh, this is when it goes south. Uh, and next time, if I get to this point, I'm not going to go there. And, and I do, I mean, I'm sure if everybody's the same, I'm probably worse than most. I get very jumpy, you know, when we have fellows or doing procedures and stuff. Because having been through the journey I've been through, <laughs> I've seen all the bad stuff. And you're like, you know what can happen, and it, it's just um, it, it it does um, it does create its own sort of level of um, uh, I don't know that angst or nervousness is the right word, but just uh, caution whenever you, you're training people to 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 appreciate that difference because they've never seen it before, and they don't they don't really realize necessarily what the uh, implications of of something bad happening. So I think. Just learning that sort of level to, to keep your practice in a, in a sensible place so you're not under treating or you're not sort of um, uh, not completing procedures which are, are completable, but you're also not crossing the line into risk all of the time. 
And that's actually a great skill to learn, right? Should you be a little anxious and guard? Some people, you know, I speak to for the webinar and otherwise, they do say they're very relaxed and do the cases, no problem. Some others say they always have a little stress kind of um, keeping their um, mind alert. What is your take? I mean, do you get kind of cautiously anxious or how, how do you handle the case yourself and for others? Um, yeah, I think, I don't think anxiety or nervousness is, is productive. I think the, the most important thing is a laser focus. It's not to drift your attention um, and it's just to make sure that you're, you're bang on in terms of thought process. And actually, you know, Colm and I uh, had uh, done a, a whole host, like hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of cases together. And if you can work with a, a partner, a wingman, and, you know, having two people focused on the patient uh, together, I think, is a very helpful thing. It just, you know, somebody might spot something here or a clinical sign there or anything, you know, uh, that I, I find very, very helpful, really accelerates your learning, keeps you comfortable, you know, and it's actually good fun as well to, to, to develop that sort of uh, practice with a, with a friend and a colleague. Perfect. And I guess, unfortunately, most people don't have this luxury. Most people are working in a lab that there are not that many people interested. But you're right. Once you have the option, it is great. Um, are there other things that you've learned working with Calm? Like, do, how does it work? Do you do you switch who goes first, who goes second? How do you guys figure out who does what? Yeah, it's just uh, it's take, take case around, really. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, or if there's particular ownership or affinity with a patient that you've known from before, fine. You know, but uh, we're very relaxed. There's no competition or ownership of we're doing more of this or doing more of that uh, and certainly in our system there's there's no sort of incentive from particular ownership of a procedure you know so it, it's um it's a very relaxed scenario and we'll, we'll interchange even during cases it's, it's fine all, all we're interested in is a, a good patient outcome and then how do you prepare for cases you know after the thousand cases you've done how, how do you prepare for each case i think that the most important thing i would say is that um you um Make sure that you know the patient well and that you understand the clinical indication um, and that they've been well worked up and you've had a good chat with them. Um, <clears throat> the, the actual technicalities of going through, you know, whatever occlusion, it, it, it's fine to have all skill sets and options. So that, that for me is not really an obsession because I'm comfortable switching between all the different options. Uh, I think what I really want to be certain is that I'm going to offer a patient a procedure that's going to benefit them, that we're not doing something that's potentially futile or, um, you know, it has a very low risk, uh, or sorry, very low likelihood of success, but high risk of the procedure itself and or that would likely be non-durable. You know, somebody's had stent failure on 10 times, you open it again, you know, it's going to close. You know, there's not it's not right to put patients through that sort of um, uh, long and complex procedure when you know that the actual long-term outcome is going to be quite poor for them. So I think making those judgments in terms of preparation are the most important things, you know, making sure that you understand things like renal function and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, just getting your ducks in a row, uh, selecting your patients well and making sure that you're going to offer a procedure that's really going to help them. Uh, that's what I would sort of uh, focus most on. And then how do you um, actually do uh, do the cases uh, um, during the case? When you do the cases, you're focused and you do the cases. And then if something goes wrong, um, how, how does that work? Especially since you have the luxury of having a second operator who is very competent and very skilled like Corm. Uh, do you multitask, try to one to do one thing and the other? How, does it ha ha how do you handle these uh, situations? Well, I mean, we're very lucky in Belfast. We've got a very experienced team right across the board. Um, and they've seen uh, all the good things and unfortunately the bad things too. Um, so everybody knows their role and they're very comfortable with it. Um, we're you know drilled in terms of understanding where things are for uh, complication X, Y, or Z. You can put your hand to them. People know how to use them. I think if a, an unexpected complication arises, the, the, the thing to do is just not not to panic immediately. It's hard not to have that reaction, but it is to, to, to try and be as measured as you can. Do something that's going to make it safe straight away and then get, get help, get colleagues, get people in the room who can just think differently, get a pair of gloves on, take the pressure off so you're not scrambling to do everything yourself. Um, but if, if it does come to sort of using coils or this or that, 
make sure that you understand what they are, what they go through, how they work. You know, the, the last thing you want to be doing in, in an emergent scenario is, is taking something out of a box for the first time and wondering what on earth it is. So uh, I think if you're going to undertake this sort of work, then it's important that you, you're you prepared and you've seen the, the different bailout strategies. I think the, the complications course that uh, Bill runs in Seattle is a, a great place for people to go and to get that distilled in a, in a short period of time. Um, but as an after follow up to that, it, you know you need to actually go and physically get your hands on these things and uh, make sure you know what they are and, and how to de- deploy or apply them if, if that's uh, what needs to be done. Perfect. And then, are there any cases that taught you a lot that you found them very useful, obviously, over the many years you've been doing this? Yeah, I think uh, the ones probably that you learn most from are where, where something adverse uh, has happened. And you've been able to manage it. Hopefully, you can maybe teach other people that you know that I've seen this and this is what it did to bail myself out of it. And when you get those sort of uh, little vignettes from people, uh, they they can if you've never seen something before and it happens in a lab in front of you, but it's been explained what the reaction and, and solution is. That that's gold. You know that that's really useful. Um, and I think actually procedures were. You, you, you're trying your best to treat a patient. You're not successful the first time. You sit down, you reanalyze it. Maybe you get a second pair of eyes or you text uh, whomever um, and you get a second opinion. And you know What are your thoughts around this? And, and you adapt your, your approach and, and make sure that the next time that you've changed the thought process or you've done something a little bit different and then you can uh, you know evolve that practice through time when you're uh, facing that sort of scenario the second time. So it's, it's all about continually adapting and learning, being willing to, to share and to listen to others, I think is important, uh, and just not staying stuck in, in one place. <clears throat> so, um, so Simon, how do you choose the people you train? Are there some things that are more important to you and a person who wants to do this that you look for when you're choosing these people? Um, I thought, well, uh, people will, will just apply for fellowships. Uh, we're, we're not always blessed with, uh, you know, 500 people coming for one job or anything. So um, generally, if, if they're uh, well qualified, recommended by somebody that you know, and they're keen, uh, you know, you're very happy to take uh, take people on for, for fellowship programs. It's just a demonstration of um, um affinity for procedure but also uh, that you you really want to learn and you have an open mind and you want to sort of move forwards with your clinical practice now how do you keep motivated what keeps you going in the lab and doing those cases or doing other things uh, that's a good question uh, I, I think always you, you send her back to, to the patient you know uh, the, the the stories of, of all the cases and, and the individuals that you've treated and how you know you've offered them a, a procedure or even a series of procedures that have been transformative for their lives and uh, <clears throat> when you're sort of stuck thinking you know is this procedure going nowhere should I abandon or whatever you have to always sort of cycle back to the thought well why was I doing this in the first place and and it's usually because people are very limited uh, they're struggling to do anything on multiple medical therapies and, and you're trying to get them to an end point that's important for their lives. And I think if you always refocus with that thought in mind, that it, it just gives you that little bit of stamina to sort of keep going and uh, hopefully get to the right place at the end of it. Perfect. And then you've done obviously amazing clinical work and now you've taken a new pathway, you know, looking at devices and development and essentially a completely new skill from the things that you're familiar with in the cath lab, which I'm sure has a lot of learning in itself. It sure does. What motivated you? <laughs> <laughs> Might be even harder actually than the CTOs. Though. Yeah. Um, so how did that happen? It was a little bit of a random opportunity. I, I honestly just got a call out of the blue and, and uh, I thought, well, well uh, why not? Um, you know, mid mid career. Um, it's a nice time of life, actually, just to pause, draw breath, and and take a sabbatical and and broaden your horizons, do something different. And uh, it's been a tremendous learning process for me. You know, and I would encourage people just if if an opportunity comes along to do something different for a period of time to to strongly consider it. Um, I'm still engaged in clinical practice. i um, doing cases each quarter, um, so. Um, I'm scratching that itch as well and um, I, I think the personal horizons have been greatly broadened uh, and it's uh, it's been a very valuable experience for me personally. 
So what excites you right now? What are the most exciting things for you at this point? Uh, um, I, I, well, I think there, there, there are some frustrations within uh, our health system uh, post-COVID, unfortunately. And um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how the likes of an NHS sort of system uh, recovers or doesn't. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity within that uh, for things to be changed and to be done a lot better. Uh, and if there was a willingness uh, of the system to adapt to it, I think that would be something that would be a very exciting challenge to try and make things better. Um, I, I think that has to be an inevitable consequence uh, of healthcare where, where I am. Um, uh, and the UK and the NHS system certainly is, is having huge struggles at the moment. So if, if a lot of us can, can uh, make that better going forward, that would be, uh, that would be a pretty exciting challenge. Wonderful. And then how do you keep in good shape through the both the clinical work but also the other types of work? What keeps you um, motivated and energized um, in a day-to-day basis? Okay, I think it's important that uh, you step out of, of the, the medical bubble. Um, so <clears throat> uh, a lot of my friends uh, and social circle, I mean, we're not all um, – uh, there's no other sort of people who are in the same uh, business really uh, so I've got a, a diverse group of folks that I interact with uh, I like to go and get my head short and watch live sport to do this to do that so uh, it, once you cross the threshold you know you're not taking the baggage with you 24 7 and you're not sort of obsessed with what's going on so you, you definitely need to be able to step out of the the, the bubble of the, the medical world, the cardiology world, the procedural world uh, that you exist in uh, and to be able to just cleanse the thought process and that <clears throat> it's reset and begin again the next day, that's all fine but you have to have something that basically uh, cleanses, the, <laughs> cleanses the brain for a few hours and, and allows you to, to do something different without the stress or the obsession or the rumination uh, which I, I don't think is a, a terribly healthy thing. So finding things that are of interest and good fun that, that remove you from the, the medical world. And uh, do you have any favorite um, uh, movie or a favorite book that you're uh, going back to? <laughs> uh, favorite movie? Uh, Monty Python, The Life of Brian. <laughs> 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 you okay. probably haven't had that response before. Uh, favorite book? Uh, this goes back to kiddie times would be uh, Lord of the Rings. You, know? you always watch the movies when they come on as well. <laughs> Yeah, no, Lord of the Rings seems to be a very popular among, uh, you know, city operators, so there's something about it, I guess. Um, and then uh, uh, how about uh, um, the things you are proud of? What are you most proud of that you've achieved so far, uh, both personally and professionally? Uh, personally, oh, gosh, I mean, that's family, really. Um, so if our, our two kids are... Uh, both up, out, graduated and into jobs. Uh, they've come out as really decent guys. Uh, I think f- for Estelle and myself to, to get through um, that phase of life and sort of continue to enjoy and, and get on with things. So it's uh, so I'm very proud of all the sort of family achievements, really. Um, uh, <laughs> within work, um, it might be a, a more difficult one. I, I mean, I think <clears throat> over a, a, a period of a career, uh, what we have been able to achieve locally in, in our health system and in Belfast is we've we've been able to offer patients really high level treatment and um, excellence in care, good good quality research, bringing new things through, education, all those things as a package. I think have um, have been put together to a really good level, and I think is as good as anybody would be offered anywhere. Um, and to, to be able to do that in, in your own sort of local sphere, I think, is, is, is a great thing. No, absolutely. And I think that's also evident on the many live cases that you have been doing uh, over the various meetings, which, you know, help people other learn this um, as well. Now, do you have any plans for retiring? Are you going to be doing this forever? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do I have plans for retiring? Not specifically, uh, but yeah, I, I mean... I do think it's important that uh, we're able to sort of pass on knowledge, disseminate. Um, but it, when you're standing, you know, yes, ramparts come along, but uh, you know, if you're you're standing, leads, stress, on calls, middle of the night, all this sort of stuff. I, I I think there does come a point in time where that's not necessarily the healthiest thing to be doing, and um, I, I don't think that high sort of octane stuff is necessarily the way forwards. 
um, past a certain point. What that number is, I'm not sh- sure. But uh, I, I definitely don't want to be 75 or 80 and still in a cat lab and um, Taking doing all that, the same stuff again. That's a definite no. Wonderful. So, so Simon, again, you've done phenomenal work on many different fronts and you're pushing the envelope in different fronts now as well. If someone came to you right now and says, you look, I want to become as good operator as you are and get very good at doing complex and CTO, what would you advise them? What would be your kind of... Uh, pearls of wisdom to follow your steps or find their own way? Um, I think, um, you know, as a, a younger trainee, definitely engage in education, uh, have an open mind for sure. Um, and it, it's really important to find uh, a good fellowship. I think having a breadth of ability is important. And it's not just about being focused about wiggling wires and um, moving catheters or, or devices or this sort of thing. I think it's really important that, that, that our next generation of leaders um, are research leaders that have a really good foundation and background in clinical trials and planning and uh, you know developing that next sort of set of strategies that are going to keep moving things forwards for us. So I, I think you know a, a fellowship program shouldn't just be a few months of you know how to how to cross septals or how to poke wires at things. It's got to be a broad and holistic sort of a, a approach to things that involves a lot of education, uh, a lot of involvement in education and delivering it yourself as well. Uh, understanding research, taking part in sort of writing trials programs. I mean, you more than anybody know the value of that. And I've, I've uh, put a gazillion people through that process. And, um, and and I think then, of course, the technical aspect too. But <clears throat> sometimes we get to, you know, the fellowship things that you can be a little bit obsessed with what's going on in the lab itself. It's important also to recognize the, the bits that are going on around it and not to get introspective. And appreciate just how the patient selection comes, uh, the workups, the post-procedural care, what happens to these folks afterwards in the longer term. And I think if you put that whole sort of thing together as a package within the right fellowship program or pathway, which might be a couple of years, uh, you know, with all those sort of chip stuff or structural things, maybe it's two or three years. Uh, so I wouldn't be in a rush to, to get myself a label and out and you know rammed into an attending job where you're just dropped in the in the deep end straight away. I think get yourself to a point where you're really comfortable with everything that you see yourself engaged in in the long term. And if that takes a bit of time, that's okay. And then when things go south, which they will, as you know, as you've seen, and people get very some people get very depressed. Any advice on how to overcome this and get back on the wagon, so to speak? Back on the horse. Um, yeah, I think it's um, uh, what's. I mean, the cycle is definitely you get upset, you get frustrated. Um, I think it's important not just to ruminate again and again. So you've got to be open about what's happened. Sit down and talk to your colleagues, to people who you know who are open to just discussing things in a, a sensible way that you're going, you want to try and learn from adverse events. You don't want to uh, force yourself into a box where you basically don't do complex procedures in future because you're going to leave so many patients behind. And omission of care is worse than commission where one in a hundred times it, it doesn't go as planned um so it, i think just you know if a complication or something bad happens be very open you know record everything and put it in the notes don't try and sort of hide stuff or sweep it under the carpet uh, and then have a review process with people that you know are, are um supportive uh, but are also going to just take a step back and give you a, a sensible opinion in a, in a way that's a learning process and not something that, that's bad and you can work through that through discussion i think that accelerates the sort of uh, the thought and emotional recovery from an adverse event and it gets you to the point where you understand that these things will happen unfortunately but you still have to treat other patients as best you can uh, and to learn from the adverse event but you know try if feasible to make sure it doesn't happen again but some of them are just unavoidable and um, I think with time you do appreciate that um, there will be adverse events that arise that just you know the best pa- pathways have been followed the best efforts have been taken uh, and unfortunately sometimes these things don't work out as we would like and that is just a part of life and uh, it, when it happens the first time it's a really dramatic event um, but you do over a career I think appreciate that uh, as long as you're making your best efforts each time and there's no sort of thing that was 
to be learned from and completely changed, uh, you, you will observe this as you as you go on, and I think as you gain maturity, you'll um, you'll you'll deal with it in, in your own way. Wonderful. And again, it's an evolving, and you always get better, as you said. So thanks again, thanks Simon for uh, spending the time with us today. Again, lots of uh, nice pearls for people to learn. Um, look forward to seeing you back in the snow. Yes. And uh, thanks again so much. No problem, Manos. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 